suddenly reservation is there and now you're supposed to compete with everyone <laughs> like equal uh, there is no no his no privilege uh, uh, the other thing uh, so the working class if if you look at the mythology theology and then the actual practice in history the workers are the entire population of the shuk now the prosperity development growth of the first three varnas happens at the cost of this this group the shudras they are working for you they are growing food for you they are doing all your work art craft etc so the, the the accumulation of wealth which goes from bottom to up is because you have systematically robbed a large section of the population of the rightful uh, uh, returns to labor which accrued to them had there not been any system like that and exploiting and extracting it for thousands of years and that is why you are privileged that is why you are educated that is why you have wealth that is why you have all these resources and then you can say we are meritorious so merit is nothing but privilege accrued through systemic exploitation exclusion discrimination for 3000 years so when uh uh when reservations happen and suddenly your community is asked to compete they're not being able to come they're not going to be still they are just they are close they work hard they do their best despite ex- free market exclusion discrimination we know what happens in uh, schools and colleges and universities the behavior uh, in higher education despite that they are not far behind Uh, the so-called meritorious crowd, and this is despite three thousand years of having nothing in their history. Um, the engagement which I have tried to do with historical work. starts from the rig vedic period which is bc 1500 goes on to later later vedic post vedic then comes to the early medieval which is now bc 600 later medieval post medieval and the british period so there's lots to uncover there and uh, at many at times you don't find material i mean you you find something and then you you know just one like the medieval period is during the moguls is a big hole there is not much work done especially in terms of slavery but there are some works which we have found there's a whole lot of work before that and after that uh during medieval period uh, sorry f- over the vedic period and the british period so i would not trace the history because that will take forever but i do, do want to mention <clears throat> if we look at the rigveda period and that is where you have the rig uh, uh, the, the four vedas and rigveda being where the purusha shukta him propounds this chaturvarna system of division of society and not of people or or human beings so in the rigveda you have more than 140 50 shlokas which talk about origins of human like all religions have adam eve adam hawa so how does humanity or human or being human being uh, the male and female originate and there are all kinds of mythologies it's the only shloka one shloka in the entire rigveda apart from the 150 shlokas which talks about the origin of society so both max miller who was a uh, expert on indian history and uh, 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 ancient history uh, and and mythology uh, and ambedkar both uh, uh, think that this was added much later to justify the system that though this is part of the rigveda this was the knowledge of the vedas came to the sages on their own from the divine being and and, and they were chosen uh, uh, the knowledge chose them and through them it was written so you get religious sanctity for this division of uh, society and not humans later on uh, you will find the dharma sutras the apastamba sutra vashishta gautama bodhayana i can go the many they then uh, also talk about this and reaffirm this so the dharma sutras reaffirm this chaturvarna ramayana mahabharata does it uh, and many other uh, commentaries on the smritis and compilations of the smritis does that then comes manu and manu compiles all these and he uh, not just talks about them he makes it legal and penal 
which means that he ascribes norms, laws, rules, regulations in economic, social, behavior, cultural behavior for each varna. And if you, if you, if you, if anyone wants to break that, then there is a punishment. So he makes it penal. That the first time when Manusprithi takes these uh, things from the Dharma Sutras and kind of says that this is what you have to do, otherwise you'll be punished, etc., etc. And it is, and later on, I think we're not sure about this, but it's Kautilya's Archa Shastra also does that, takes from there. And under the Gupta period, this normative theoretical form, which didn't exist, is then implemented by state power uh, uh, very very strongly. And that is uh, the Gupta period onwards, you find that endogamy, uh, uh, you know, uh, sticking to your hereditary occupation, sticking to your social norms, social segregation, all that happens. And it is part, it is form part of the social living and culture of the people. So it's a slow process. And even the theoretical norms of uh, uh, Chat Chaturvarna and what, who's a Shudra and who's not a Shudra, they evolve. And eventually, somewhere down the line, the Shudras split up uh, because actually any kind of business, including agriculture, was uh, ascribed to the Vaishyas. But agriculture being and any other labor being uh, very hard, uh, uh, Shudras were employed to do that. And though the Shudras who did agriculture and other hard labor lost their untouchability because then you cannot, uh, you know, eat the food they have grown or all that. And the people amongst the Shudras who continue to do cleaning work, work with animal leather and other kind, basket making. I mean, what's wrong with basket makers, right? But basket makers are included. Uh, medicine men and women are included. So that list of the, uh, the, the untouchables, starting from Chandala, the first one, expands. And you, uh, fringe tribal communities are added, other frontier people are added. So as the empire is expanding and you're taking over their land, what do you do with them? So if you uh, read Vivekananda Jha, he says, uh, it, with the Nishadas, which is the tribal people, what do you do with them? Where do you put them in the Varna Devastha? So they say, okay, the, <clears throat> the tribal king or, or the head we can't dismiss. So that person can sit with us, eat with us, but their populace will be untouchable. So they keep creating these additions uh, uh, and exclusions of different people and it, it, it evolves. And then finally it becomes a structure. And that is when this is imposed and then it continues for a very long time. Now you wonder that uh, this, what happens with them and with the coming of the Arabs and the Mughals and the Turks. So first person to come and invade is Muhammad Qasim. I will not go into the detail. I'll just, then the Ghaznavis, Khiljis, Tughlaqs, they all come. They don't do anything with the system. In fact, if you look at their written records, they will, they praise the Brahmin. They say, oh, they are such wise people, etc., etc. It's a brilliant system. And of course, you have a captive a population of untouchables and caste slaves to exploit. Because hierarchy is, uh, as Mosvi, uh, she's, uh, Shereen Mosvi is the only one who is, her thesis was on slavery in the Mughal era. She says that the Islamic people or the Arabs who came, to India, they already, when the Arabs uh, beat the Turks and they form the Islamic empire, within the Arabs there are various tribes and there are hierarchies. So the idea of hierarchy wasn't, wasn't alien to them. So when they came here, they liked the hierarchy. They're like, yes, okay, that's good, fine. There's, humans are not all equal. We like hierarchy. So they accepted it. Uh, at the same time in South of India, Karnataka, Andhra, Tamil Nadu, you had the Vijayanagara empire, Chola period. Again, you see the, the same situation happening from the text there and the secondary analysis that caste system is very, very formulated. There is segregated living, uh, endogamy, occupational mobility is not there. All that is really, really uh, in the medieval, early, later and uh, post-medieval period. Uh, caste, caste hierarchy, norms, relationships are deeply entrenched and continue through the Mughal period and then come the British. Uh, they come to trade, they get a license from Jahangir, they set up a factory in Surat, they start trading, they have some disagreements with the Bengal king, they fight the battle of Plassey in 1757, they win the battle because the general of the Bengal Nawab, I forget his name, he defects, you might know, yeah, exactly, 
तेरा जो डॉलर और समथिंग एंड दे दे विन एंड दे गेट द बंगाल प्रेसिडेंसी देन मद्रास प्रेसिडेंसी बॉम्बे प्रेसिडेंसी सो द ब्रिटिश देन रूल इन टू थर्ड्स ऑफ इंडिया डायरेक्टली अंडर दिस प्रेसिडेंसी बट अंडर द रिमेनिंग पार्ट्स आर दिस प्रिंसली स्टेट्स वर कंटिन्यूइंग द सेम काइंड ऑफ सोशल स्ट्रक्चर व्हिच एग्जिस्टेड फॉर द grandfathers and great grandfathers continued so and not that british are changing the social structure in the british parliament there is the abolitionist movement which starts there is a demand to stop slavery because of it's inhuman etc etc and finally the british parliament passes this law in about 1833 or so that slavery trade in slaves so basically uh, slavery i'm not sure i have to read the real legal documents for that but i think uh, you could uh, you could not bring in more slaves newer slaves uh, to sell or auction in the markets of europe but existing slaves you could you could trade in those slaves or you can continue to have the slaves but slavery in terms of going to africa abducting trafficking the criminal act of that entire process uh, was banned but of course you have a huge population of slaves in the americas and europe what do you do with them you have to use them so that continues and there is this abolitionist movement and and you must understand what this study made us realize as we talk about dalits as untouchable etc but there's a huge chunk of the population who actually were slaves caste slaves caste ordained slaves so you are born into slavery Uh, some of the examples are the Paria, Pulia, and the Chamuras of Kerala, and there are others. So, when the British came, they had this habit of doing, uh, you know, scientific surveys. So, about eight, eighteen forty-one or some time, there is this British Labour Commission, and it takes seven to eight years to do a cadastral survey of the country to find what are the labour norms, how does the Indian economy or the existing Indian system uh, employ labor what are the norms etc and the, the the commission report is available online you can see and they say that slavery and bonded labor exist now it's basically slavery but they get confused because they think of slavery as the transatlantic slave trade which they have seen happening of africans being abducted and brought here you see communities working for each other and it's not it's settled in it is accepted this part of the culture there is no overt violence even the so called slave castes are uh, you know they for centuries they are born in slavery so they have accepted and internalized their victimhood and slave mindset so it's not abhor ab abhorrent or or violent or all that so they do not see it they think of this as bonded labor and they think of uh, the slavery the the very harsh form which is violently abducting people hunt in shipping them many dying and then auctioning them off like chattel chattel slavery uh, uh, and then uh, you know putting them in chains like animals they didn't see that in india so they didn't think it was slavery but it was slavery uh so they call it bonded slave they they are confused sometimes they use the word slavery in the report sometimes they use the word bonded labor in the report and then finally when this question is raised in the british parliament uh, uh, that why is east india company employing slaves so 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 every Brit the, the britishers were employing slaves just like the uh, the the the, the savarnas here who were all labor agrestic labor which is ag agricultural labor and other labor was done by slaves some uh, who who uh, anyways so uh, so when the commission puts its report puts its report and then there is a, a, a question raised in the british parliament that you have now so they were focusing on jamaica and british slave uh, trade which they stopped then they moved to india and when the question of india was asked uh there was there is a letter sent by the viceroy of india at that time that no this there is no slavery here it is a very benign form of relationships in fact the bonded labor or slave depends on the master for their their survival and in times of need they are the ones who bail them out and all that so it's a very benign form of a social construct so that delays the abolition of slavery uh, uh by 10 years 
and in 1843 is the when the british actually they actually don't ban slavery they don't make slavery illegal they say buying and selling is prohibited and uh, any person who harms a slave physically assaults abuse violently there will be criminal proceedings taken against them so they do not define slavery and they also do not ban it which we which i thought they had but when i read something recently a thesis by this german lady she looks at 1843 to 1999 1919 i think bonded labor act which i will she has phd's on that and it's quite revealing what she writes and this tremendous work done if if one looks one can find that they actually didn't ban slavery the slavery is this we define slavery as this this is this this and now it's illegal to do in, engage in all these acts they didn't do it they just very they 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 kind of discouraged it and kept it open for interpretation for the magistrates the judges and the lawgivers before that when they came to india and tried to establish the so this is 1843 now when they came to india they had to engage with the law of the land and i'll read something and you'll be quite surprised uh in 1772 areas under the direct rule of the british were subjected to judicial reforms and the rule for the first time reforms uh and this was done by warren hastings and it was decreed in all suits regarding inheritance marriage caste and other religious usages as institutions the law of the quran with respect to the muhammadans and those of the shastar that is how they pronounced it and wrote it s h a s t r shastar they couldn't say shastras with respect to the hindus and they write h i n d o o as hindus shall apply <laughs> on all such occasions the malvi and the brahmin priests shall respectively attend to expound the law and they shall sign the report and assign uh, in the pass in the passing the degree so brahmin pandits who were well versed in the shastras were then posted in the king's court set up in kolkata madras and bombay they were required to submit reports pertaining to specific cases known as vyavastha to the court so the british employed priests and molvis because they wanted them to interpret law according to the hindu law this is 1777 so this continued till 1843 and beyond so hindu law was being practiced is untouchability caste enslavement all that you can imagine according to the shastras and, and manuscript manuscripti and there's another text which were part of that legal di- uh, document which were used by uh, and and for 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 uh, muslims the quran so, so so you can imagine this is a system which is continuing till uh, 1843 in its very very raw form and very op- For very very evolved, formalized jati, sub jati, occupation, rule, everything which is being now taken so long to formalize and refine, and you know it's being implemented by the British. So they also as reparations, and not to the upper caste but to the lower caste. As Shashi Tharoor is making the case that the British owes reparations, but it wasn't the upper caste who was working the fields; it was the the low caste who was working the fields and making revenue for the british so they they who who do they owe the reparations to is a big question to be asked uh so then um so this is a brief very brief snapshot i can go in much detail in each era and epoch which i will not uh but uh and so when the british kind of went ahead and said ah oh, don't buy and sell slaves but do whatever you want we'll interpret it accordingly uh, don't harm them so what do so what what does happen i mean even if uh, tomorrow the slaves say i'm not a slave anymore they have nothing being given to them for compensation how does a slave family whose <laughs> father grandfather great 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 grandfather for th- hundreds of years if not thousands has no uh, ownership of land access to education wealth anything accumulated now su- suppose suddenly with this new decree, decree they are free to 
kind of have some mobility, where do they go? They cannot go anywhere. They continue to work with the same person because there is no compensation given. Of the kind which Lincoln had promised when, they, uh, when slavery was abolished and uh, there was uh, the slave, uh, slaves were free, that every family of four will should get a uh, 40 acres of land and a mule so that they can start growing uh, uh, their own food and building their life from scratch, which they also didn't get. Some parts in California, they gave it to the families, but it was taken away. Uh, that history is just uh, very, very amazing. So there was no decrease made by like uh, like that made with the British that, okay, you're free now, the master should give you something. Uh, so how do you start? You don't. So you continue to be bonded labor, debt slaves. And this continues till the finally the, I don't know, the Bonded Labor Act in independent India. So in the, at the I mean, it's just continuous. There is no break in the system. Uh, in Punjab also, the, the, the Dalits were not uh, allowed to own land till, till much two, two decades ago or something. So, so this is continuing and we, we are blind to this. This is, there is no end to this system till, till modern, till the 80s or 90s. And, and, and then suddenly reservation is there and now you are supposed to compete with everyone. <laughs> like equal. Uh, there is no, no, his, no privilege. Uh, uh, the other thing. Uh, so the working class, if, if you look at the mythology, theology and then the actual practice in history, the workers are the entire population of the Shudra. Now, the prosperity, development, growth of the first three Varanas happens at the cost of this, this group, the Shudras. They are working for you, they are growing food for you, they are doing all your work, art, craft, etc. So, the, the, the accumulation of wealth which goes from bottom to up is because you have systematically robbed a large section of the population of the rightful uh, uh, returns to labor which accrued to them had there not been any system like that and exploiting and extracting it for thousands of years and that is why you are privileged, that is why you are educated, that is why you have wealth, that is why you have all these resources and then you can say we are meritorious. So merit is nothing but privilege accrued through systemic exploitation, exclusion, discrimination for 3000 years. So when, uh, 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 when reservations happen and suddenly your community is asked to compete, they are not being able to, com they are not going to be, still they are just, they are close. They work hard, they do their best despite ex free market exclusion discrimination. We know what happens in uh, schools and colleges and universities, the behavior. Uh, in higher education, despite that, they are not far behind uh, the so-called meritorious crowd. And this is despite 3000 years of having nothing in their history. So how do you compensate for that? That is the question. Is it justified, morally justified? And that is where there are uh, certain uh, arguments which exist. And one of the first persons to talk about this was John Locke <coughs> in the 16th, 17th century. <laughs> John Locke is talking about reparation. So it exists since a very long time. Um, okay, I think I should talk for another 10, 15 minutes and I should stop. It's already 7. So he believed, Locke believed that uh, People have natural rights. All people equally have natural rights. It accrues to everyone. And people were naturally disposed. Their basic instinct and mentality, desire is to live in peace and harmony. This is Locke's belief. You may disagree with it. Unlike uh, what Hobbes would say, Thomas Hobbes, that uh, uh, with, about the state of nature, that if you left human beings to the stage of state of nature, there will be competition, conflict and chaos. Uh, I would like to believe that that's not the case. Conflict, competition and chaos can be very, very tiring. And after a while, you just don't want to do all that anymore. And you just want to settle in peacefully and, you know, 
just live in harmony and i like i th- i think i like uh, Locke in that sense so Locke says that that is the the nature of human beings and everyone has naturally given rights which are equal and if someone defies these rights if someone harms someone uh, there's a wrong doing done by one person to another then that person is liable to receive uh, uh, reparations um, and to discourage this kind of behavior he prescribes punishment uh, and severe punishment so that others do not do the same thing others uh, look at that and they uh, they are di- uh, discouraged from uh, repeating these acts of violence or wrongdoing against others uh, so for him the right to pres- reparations emerge emerges from the right to self preservation and these rights could be demanded only against the goods and services of the offender which means that if there is an offender then the reparation must be demanded of the goods and services of the offender so it is up to the offender whoever that is it could be the state it could be some groups communities it could be an individual uh, it is up to them to then uh, use their own resources to compensate this is what locke says and sometimes this does not accrue directly to the victim it could be others the victim's family if the victim is dead they are descendants so he he has already made this argument in the 17th century for example and this is i'll quote if a girl's parents are murdered she has a claim to reparation uh, for the harm that the ensuing hardships of life will bring to her uh, and even if that harm has not led to a material loss for that girl it has caused a damage uh, psychological damage her self respect her moral standing or whatever however the society views her and she has to now struggle through life she owns uh, reparations are owed to her this is what and uh, in in addition an apology reparations so i'll come to the definition uh, and what does apol- where does apology stand there um okay so there are three arguments which are put forth for reparation one is john philosophical argument you can read read that and uh, it's there's lots uh, online and then there are newer arguments which are more specific which are again ascribed to uh, philosophers etc who have taken uh, uh, from uh, uh, other writers and created these arguments so the first argument is called the harm argument uh, the harm argument relies on the idea that the transgressors of slavery or the people who who impose slavery untouchability or caste slavery initiated an unbroken chain of harm linked as a cause and effect that began with the slaves or the extranchables or the ex enslaved but continues to affect their descendants so some someone in the past might have been harmed enslaved as an african american or all the cases i told you or as a dalit but the harm continues it's not that the harm is gone there is a cause and link which leads that harm psychological trauma is passed on epigenetics is called uh, you know your genes are some of your genes are triggered because of trauma and you have anxiety and etc because you have inherited that trauma from inter- intergenerationally and you have that genetic also happening psychologically also loss of education loss of no property loss of nothing i mean you have to each generation has to re, re rebuild themselves sometimes if there are shocks affecting you there's a flood there's covid there's loss of a uh, death of a earning member each generation has to then do that uh so since the transgressors uh mm, so the so the descendants have a right because they are affected by the harm. harm of their past uh ancestors so that is the harm argument the inheritance argument is very simple it says that when you abolish slavery caste slavery african american slavery etc when you stop that those people 
you owed them compensation you used them for a long time you subjected them to, them to the worst form of violence humiliation and trauma when you morally thought that this was wrong for one human being to perpetuate on another and you made it legally uh, 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 you stopped it legally then why didn't you compensate them for the harm when you have a road accident train accident the state uh, the indian railways has an accident and people die the state compensates right because they their families are harmed if you have to relocate tribals from somewhere forcibly mostly without without their consent you give them land house or some form of compensation so when you think that is something wrong is being done to them not of their own making then you compensate them then why in this case there was no reparation when the african americans were uh, emancipated from slavery there was no reparation when we ab abolished untouchability there was no reparation when we banned uh, 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 bonded labor there is no reparation how there was no compensation so their descendants uh, deserve compensation if they didn't get it they should so it's a called the inheritance argument because compensation reparation restitution was owed to them and they did not get it doesn't mean their descendants should get it that's the inheritance argument so if you if i'm going to say that the british kind of willy nilly uh, not really ban slavery but kind of they de regulated it till uh, 1843 for the 100 years they were ruling in india they was uh, reparations because they banned slavery in the us uh, in the in the uk and in europe wherever they had their trading posts and their colonies of course they also didn't pay reparations there but that doesn't mean we don't ask them for reparations um and uh the last argument which is uh it's called a spiritual renewal argument which says that with compensation and restitution while compensation and restitution are essential and the starting points in the process of healing and reconciliation true reparations would demand in addition that there is also acceptance of historic crimes and injustice you cannot the society the people cannot move ahead unless they accept that the wrong has been done there is no acceptance i mean you the attitude which you have these days with reservation and identity is so uh, violent and aggressive that uh, you know to even imagine that someone will say oh sorry you know you know you're right i mean we subjugated you and your descendants for 3000 years we made slaves out of you i'm really sorry i don't know i cannot repay you but here please have reservation i'm not going to trouble you i'm not going to say you've stolen my seat you don't deserve it and all that because you deserve it more than i ever will unless you say that the society never moves forward because in psychologically you're stuck you're defi you're justifying your privilege all the time because otherwise you have to look in the mirror and you 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 will be like oh my god i am the product of 3000 years of exclusion and discrimination and my privilege is because i subjugated millions of people that is difficult to accept and but the spiritual uh, renewal argument which is given by this guy is a very famous guy tani hishi's name is he is african american but his name is hawaiian ta ni ishi and he has this article in new york times where he talked about reparation and brought it back into kind of vogue or not vogue but he he it was a very famous argument uh so he says and to quote uh what i'm talking about is more than recompense for past injustice more than a handout a pay off hush money or reluctant bribe what i'm talking about is a national reckoning that would lead to spiritual re renewal reparations would mean a revolution of the american consciousness a reconciling of our self image as the great democratizer with the facts of our history so he's appealing to do to the white people to everyone that look uh, just paying compensation will not help uh, you can you know um, 
there has to be internal churning. You have to accept a wrong has been done. You apologize for it. You feel pain and repentance. And then maybe, and maybe the society can move ahead and and say that yes, you know, we, we are the same, we are we are we are all equal, and let's try and then figure out how that what that means to live together. And uh, and I think I'll end with saying that. The difference between compensation is like the examples I gave is that a wrongdoing necessarily may not be there. So government compensates someone for making a road through their field, so they'll compensate. Or uh, there is a natural calamity, so you pay. Uh, restitution is where you take the person who has been, so again, there is no wrongdoing or maybe there is wrongdoing, maybe there is not, but the person has lost something. So suppose there's a girl who, whose cycle is stolen or uh, is lost. We don't know which. And someone comes and returns it but does not apologize for it. So the cycle has been restored to her, restituted, but she 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 uh, uh, she she feels she's, uh, but she went through trauma and grief and, and, and loss. That hasn't been compensated for. And reparation includes an apology. So if the person says, I'm really sorry I took this, cycle without your asking and you were worried and etc. Here's your cycle and then he apologizes or she apologizes. Then she feels satisfied. Then she says, I got my cycle and this person has apologized. So my emotions are soothed. Uh, I don't feel so traumatized anymore. That is reparation. So you reparate the, and there could be uh, the same when the person comes and says, oh, I'm sorry, I lost your cycle. It's, it's broken, but I'm extremely sorry. So she feels this side. It's okay, it doesn't matter. I would have bought a new cycle anyway. <laughs> or it gives me an excuse to ask my parents for a new cycle, whatever. But she feels satisfied. Even that is reparation. So there is no material compensation, but there is an apology. There is an expression of guilt. There is an expression all that. So these are the subtle differences. I think I'll stop here because then I can keep going on. And uh, so if my question was, if you see in terms of the black movement, as far as I know, Malcolm X never asked for reparation. What he asked for uh, the representation or being in the driver's seat for the community. And uh, if you see in India, uh, it will be great if you enlighten me if Baba Khan has said something about this. And uh, if you see what happened when Kashiram was kind of took power. So did ask for direct reparation, but what he did since he came in power, a redistributed land, went for a uh, change in names of you know the more 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 than symbolic in district name, the kind of which a legal dignity. What we saw was change in the material uh, conditions of a lot of scheduled cost population in UP also under the reform. So, would you also consider this kind of reparation? Like what approach you would kind of like asking for reparation, like asking for your master? Like, okay, give me, you owe me an apology. You owe, you owe me the wrongs, resource, wrongs. You, you owe me resources. A kind of taking the, what do you say, uh, taking the representation yourself and doing that social justice to your own people. <coughs> Thanks for the question. It's a good, great question. And that is the key question. So, <clears throat> um, I'm not sure about Malcolm X. I haven't read him very well. So, I cannot say his exact enunciations were with regard to reparations. But even before Malcolm and after Malcolm, there have been many who have actually asked for reparations. And there are two schools of thoughts, even among the African American intellectuals, etc., that I mean, they've 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 done a fantastic job of uh, understanding what they need and what they want, and their hist their history is not too far back in time. They have very good records uh, in the South, where the slaves were brought, uh, in Atlanta, where they were auctioned out. Then they went to various estates. Estate records are there. How many slaves came? What were the families? What was their work? They know exactly how much work they did, what work they did, what were the wages owed to them and what was not paid. And then the violence, the lynching, the rape of women. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson had 
17 children from his slaves, slaves in them. And they are all descendants, they, they are identified. Uh, and so, each Thomas Jefferson had about 640 slaves he ran on his estate. And he had meticulous, meticulous documents, 600, 6,800 documents, which, you know, how slaves were used, what they did, etc. So the records are there, which help the African Americans to then decide how do we want reparation. So if you look at William Darity's new book, From Here to Equality, he's a brilliant book. If you, any one of you are interested, uh, Professor William Darity Jr., his book is called From Here to Equality. He, he traces the entire history of uh, uh, the African experience. And they have two things. Uh, I mean, in fact, I'm writing a paper for him where he shared his work with me and he's asking me this question. I mean, so this, there is one school of thought where you identified each job, each work, each atrocity and you, and you, and you airmark a compensation for it and then you calculate that. A, it is not possible in our case because it's a long history. We don't have records. So we can't do that. The second idea in school of thought is to give lump sum compensation. So, for example, in terms of education, he comes up with what is called baby bonds. So, baby bond is that you take the state provides a lump sum amount in the name of a child which is born. As soon as the child is born and reaches a certain age, the government puts in certain amount in the bank or in a mutual fund, etc. And that then earns interest. And then when the child is off going college age because education, school education is free in America, what is expensive is university, higher education, then that money is released for them. So that is one aspect. And there are many such things. Worse. Now what, <clears throat> uh, you, you rightly said that whenever there is a Bahujan or a party which comes in, they do whatever they can to re redistribute policies, etc. And, and, and if the onus is on them, if they are there, they, something will happen. If they are then, then, then what? So, reparation should be a constitutional provision and a right. It doesn't matter which government comes or not. And uh, that is what we are, the argument we, are, we want to make. And Ambedkar, I think, did, I mean, he thought that when land, he talked about land reform and land distribution. And he thought that um, that would help. But of course, land reform were quite a disaster in our country. So, it did not help. Interestingly, he is never, I, I, I have to now do that research on this aspect because this paper also wants me to write about Ambedkar's thought on reparations. So I don't know. But my guess is whatever I know from uh, secondary literature and talking to people, he's never mentioned the word reparations ever. He's talked about compensation, the word uh, maybe in the parliamentary debates or his writings. And land is one thing. But I think he, my I, when I was reflecting on it, I think he saw his community as untouchables as, and that untouchability was directly in association with the Brahmins and Brahmi because they will get polluted ritually, spiritually uh, and uh, so so the, the entire burden of the Brahmins impurity fell on the untouchable. So for him education was the most important thing that it is only through education that this can be, this he can attack or he can equalize the equation of the Dalits with the Brahmins because education is the key and if you get education you are like Brahmins. But I I I'm not sure whether he thought through about compensating for the you know the material and loss of wealth. Uh, land reform definitely he, he talks about. But beyond that there is some talk but I'm not sure exactly but he did not articulate it as reparations interestingly and uh, we need to figure that out what he was thinking. And um, so I think it should not be on specific governments. It should be a demand from a, 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 something which needs to be enshrined in a constitution through legislative change. Um, that land reform or land transfer has to happen. Uh, for education, there has to be lump sum uh, money kept aside. Uh, I would, we had suggested a commission, a reparations commission is to be created. And under those, that commission, there will be subcommittees. And each committee will look into different aspects. And these will be people from various communities of the affected groups uh, who understand these issues. And they will come up with formulations and suggestions. 
education em, uh, employment uh, business private sector wealth accumulation financial sector i mean you can go on and on and then come up with policy measures of how to compensate in lump sum to families uh, through some scheme we still thinking about what form it should take